Okay, I'm, I'm very grateful for the invitation to come here. I was here 12 years ago at this conference, uh, uh, 2005, and it's great uh, to be back. I really appreciate it. Okay, uh, I will talk about the relation between monetary policy and financial stability policy, including uh, macroprudential uh, and also to some extent uh, microprudential policy. Okay, some general questions. What is the relation between monetary policy and financial stability policy? How can they be distinguished? Should they have the same or different goals? Should they be conducted separately or coordinately? Should they be conducted by the same or by different authorities? What if monetary policy would pose a threat to financial stability? Should monetary policy ever leaning uh, against uh, the wind of credit booms and asset uh, prices? Well, these, the answers to these questions and the questions themselves continue to be debated. What I will examine, the questions I will examine here, are how to distinguish different economic policies. How can, in particular, monetary policy and financial stability policy be distinguished? Should monetary policy have a third goal, financial stability? Should monetary and macroprudential policies be conducted separately or coordinately? Should they be conducted by the same or different authorities? And what if monetary policy would pose a threat to financial stability? And finally, should monetary policy ever lean against the wind? And here are my short answers. We, di we distinguish policies by their goals, their instruments, and the responsible authorities. And monetary and financial stability policies are, as far as I can see, very different, uh, mostly, in a sense, orthogonal. Monetary policy should not have a third uh, goal, financial stability. That follows from a simple but important principle for economic policies. Economic policies should only have goals that they can achieve. They should not have goals that they cannot achieve. Monetary policy cannot achieve financial stability, therefore it should not have that as a goal. Normally, I think one should conduct the policies separately. Uh, same or different authorities, the important thing is to have uh, separate decision-making bodies, regardless of whether they are run by different authorities or by the same. Uh, if monetary policy would pose a threat to financial stability, well, the, I, I think the Bank of England model uh, is nice. That it's actually the macroprudential authority, the financial uh, policy committee, that makes a judgment and decides. And if it finds that monetary policy threatens financial stability, it warns the monetary policy committee. Uh, I may have time to say a few details on that. Finally, leaning against the wind. But I think only if you can find support from a convincing cost-benefit analysis that the benefits exceed the costs. Also, I think one should remember uh, the rem Swedish example, the dramatic leaning 2010 and 2013, and the equally dramatic turnaround in 2014. I don't think any central banker wants to do that once again. And also systematic law leaning against the wind. Uh, it actually, as far as I can see, it lowers average inflation and it lowers interest rates and increases the possibility of being hit by the effective lower bound. So anyhow, how to distinguish economic uh, policies? Well, goals, instruments, responsible authorities. If you take fiscal policy, uh, they have different goals, they have different suitable instruments, fiscal policy and monetary policy, uh, different instruments and different authorities. Still, there is considerable interaction. I mean, fiscal policy affects inflation and real activity. Monetary policy affects government revenues and expenditures. Still, they are conducted separately, not coordinately. Uh, it's a Nash equilibrium between the fiscal authorities and the uh, monetary, pol uh, monetary policy authorities. So, question, is the relation between monetary and financial stability policies any different from uh, those between fiscal and monetary policies? 
Anyhow, how to distinguish monetary policy? Well, uh, the goal is very simple. Fle with, let's take flexible inflation targeting. Then we have price stability and full employment. Or more concretely, stabilize inflation around the inflation target and unemployment around its long run sustainable rate. The instruments, normal times, the policy rate and communication forecast forward guidance, possibly publishing a policy rate path. Some central banks do that. In crisis times, crisis management, uh, things are very different. A whole set of unconventional measures, balance sheet policies, foreign exchange policy, interventions, currency floor, etc. And the authority is uh, the central bank. OK, macroprudential policy. Well, the goal is actually quite complex. Financial stability is not immediately obvious how to define financial stability. Uh, a definition I like, uh, and, and it's quite common, uh, is that fin the financial system can fulfill its three main functions with sufficient resilience to disturbances that threaten those functions. And it's really resilience here that is a crucial thing. In the future, there will be new shocks uh, of an unanticipated kind from an unanticipated direction. There is no way to predict what the shocks will be, what disturbances will hit the economy. The only thing we can do is to make sure that the, uh, the system is sufficient, sufficiently resilient so it can withstand pretty heavy shocks. Also, it's important to have a secondary goal for uh, financial uh, stability policy. Uh, something like support uh, general government economic policies or, or so. We don't want the stability of the graveyard. Uh, Paul, Ta Paul Tucker has a fine paper uh, on the possibility that we need a political decision of, of the standard of resilience if there is a trade-off between resilience and, and, and dynamism and, and growth. The instruments, normal times, crisis prevention, supervision, regulation, communication, stress tests, and so on. Crisis times, crisis management, a whole lot of additional instruments. Let me not uh, get into those here. Authorities, that varies quite a bit uh, across countries. Uh, there could be one or several FSAs. The central bank could have some instruments. The treasury could also have some instruments. But my main point is that monetary and macroprudential policies are really very different. Should monetary policy have a third goal, financial stability? Uh, my answer is no. And the important principle is that economic policies should only have goals that they can achieve. Monetary policy can achieve price stability and full employment. So they are suitable goals. It cannot achieve financial stability. That, therefore, that is not a suitable goal. I mean, if, if there's one thing we should have learned from the financial crisis, it is that price stability does not bring financial stability. You need a separate policy to, to achieve and ma maintain uh, and achieve financial stability. There is no way monetary policy can achieve sufficient resilience. I mean, you need more capital, less funding risk. There is no way. Uh, Monetary policy can achieve that. Uh, there are no systematic effects of monetary policy on financial stability. When we, the sign is often inter, indeterminate. If you raise the policy rate, you may improve or you may deteriorate financial stability depending on the circumstances. And the effects are often small. So what about leaning against the wind? I will get back to that. The best theoretical argument for leaning uh, is from Jeremy Stein. He pointed out that monetary policy gets in all of the cracks. That's a fine theoretical argument. But what about the data and the empirics? Well, em empirical estimates indicate that a modest policy rate increase will barely cover the bottom of those cracks. To fill the cracks, the policy rate would have to be increased so much that it might kill uh, the economy. Qualitative results are not enough in this discussion. We need quantitative results. We need numbers. Without numbers on the costs and benefits, we cannot say anything more. 
Okay, uh, actually, I was at a conference at the IMF uh, last week, uh, and Bill White uh, was summing up uh, the conference. And he used a car uh, metaphor, a driving metaphor. And what he said was that currently, monetary policy steps on the accelerator, whereas financial stability policy steps on the brake. That doesn't seem good, he said. I think this is a wrong. Uh, metaphor. If, you're, if we are forced to stay within cars and driving, uh, uh, his metaphor implies that the two policies are close substitutes and work in similar way. Uh, if we have, I think, a better car metaphor is this one. The monetary policy keeps a steady speed. If uh, the road is uphill, you need to, to, to push down on the accelerator. If the road is downhill, you need to push on the brake. Financial stability policy keeps the airbags and the safety belts functioning and on. So policies are mostly orthogonal. Uh, I mean, monetary policy tightens and eases financial conditions through the policy rate path to achieve price stability and full employment. This has no systematic effect on financial stability. Sometimes it has a positive, sometimes a negative usually small or zero effect, depending on the circumstances. The financial stability uh, policy affects resilience through capital and funding uh, regulation. This has no systematic effects on financial conditions. Sometimes uh, it tightens, sometimes it eases uh, financial conditions, but usually we have small or zero uh, circumstances. So I think the policies are really mostly orthogonal. Uh, uh, okay, conducted separately or coordinately. In normal times, crisis prevention. It's important to distinguish between crisis pre prevention and crisis management. They are very different. Uh, I think it's best to conduct them separately, also when conducted by the same authority. But each policy should be fully informed about the conduct and impact of the other policy and take that into account. So this is like a Nash equilibrium, it's not a coordinated equilibrium or joint optimization. And of course, monetary policy is much more effective in achieving price stability and real stability. The financial stability policy is much more effective in achieving financial stability. So the Nash equilibrium is pretty, pretty good. In crisis times, crisis prevention, things are very different. I mean, then you have full cooperation between all uh, the relevant uh, uh, Authorities, uh, uh, let me not go into that by stay with it, stay in, in crisis prevention issues. Uh, let me actually uh, just mention, there are two, there are two uh, clean models uh, that I know. One is the Bank of England model, when you have everything in the bank, but you have two separate committees. Uh, Don Cohn and Paul Tucker has good papers on uh, the working of these committees and why you need two committees for, 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 for good policy. The Swedish model, uh, the FSA has uh, financial stability as an objective and all the ma macro and micro potential instruments. The Riksbank has monetary policy, no financial stability instruments. Uh, so it has nothing under crisis prevention, under Crisis management, of course, it has liquidity support, lending of last resort, but it has, doesn't have a monopoly on that. Actually, the National Debt Office can and did do a lot of lending of last resort in the last crisis. Uh, let me not get into, into details. There are details on the Swedish model in, in the paper because it may not be that well known. What if there is a threat of monetary if, what if monetary policy would pose a threat to financial stability? One should never say never. There could be situations when monetary policy might pose a threat. Well, the Bank of England, they have a good model. In their August 2013 forward guidance promise, the bank promised not to raise the interest rate until unemployment had fallen below a certain level. But there were three uh, knockouts, exceptions. And the third one was that if the FPC would judge that monetary policy poses a significant threat to financial stability, that it cannot contain with its instruments, then the bank was not bound by, the MPC was not bound uh, by, by its promise. 
But importantly, it should be the uh, Financial Stability Authority, not the monetary policy, policy one, that makes a judgment and warns the uh, monetary policy authority. Uh, and then the monetary policy authority may choose to adjust monetary policy or, or, or not. Effectively, it's a kind of comply or explain a situation for the MPC. Uh, but this preserves uh, the independence of monetary policy, one can say. So I think that's a, that's a way to handle uh, the, the, the possible situation that the uh, Financial Stability Authority cannot manage on their own with, with, with all their instruments. Okay, lean against the wind. It's strongly promoted by the BIS, uh, that we, which we know and will shortly hear again, I think. It's followed by uh, Norges Bank and also by the RBA, previously followed by the Riksbank, but now dramatically abandoned. Here is what the Fed and Riksbank forecast for inflation and unemployment look like in June 2010. As you see, both had the inflation forecast below target uh, and both had the unemployment forecast way above any long-run sustainable rate. So the forecasts were quite similar. The policies were very different. The Fed continued to keep the policy rate between zero and, and 25 basis points, uh, used forward guidance and started preparing QE2. The Riksbank raised the policy rate from 25 basis points to 200 basis points a year later. As you may know, I uh, was a member of the executive board during this time, and I dissented against every single uh, policy rate increase uh, there. What if the Fed had followed the Riksbank example? I think we all shudder at the thought. Anyhow, so this is what it looks like. Here you see the policy rates the policy rates uh, 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 of the euro area, uh, the US, actually the owning rate of the euro area, and then the US, UK, and, and Sweden. Thick red is the Swedish policy rate. So here you see the dramatic uh, uh, policy rate increase between the summer of 2010 and the summer of 2011. And what happened to inflation? Well, inflation was pretty close to target in the summer of 2010. But you see, it just went down uh, uh, close to zero. OK, what about uh, uh, the real interest rate? Well, you can see that the real interest rate started from a low level, but increased dramatically. This is actually uh, the, Fed, the policy rate minus current inflation, which I think is a good uh, proxy for, for the short real interest rate. But anyhow, you see how dramatically it increased. And you see what a gap, real interest rate gap, opened up between this, the Swedish real interest rate and, and those in, in the other three economies. I mean, this is, this is drama, a large a several percentage point uh, interest rate gap. And uh, the exchange rate, you can see that the krona depreciated dramatically at the beginning of the crisis, which was good. It dampened the effect. Uh, uh, on the crisis and it helped export uh, a bit. But then you see what a dramatic appreciation we got with this uh, real interest rate differential. And then what about unemployment? Well, unemployment was on its way down in the summer of 2010, but then it flattened out and it even increased somewhat. Okay, so this was uh, leading uh, and then it went on for a while. But then there was a turnaround. Uh, and about a year, I left the uh, Riksbank uh, to some extent in protest uh, in, in, in May 2013 because uh, my colleagues uh, were not listening to the good arguments I thought I and my colleague Carolina Ekholm had. Anyhow, about a year later, uh, the majority of the Riksbank uh, turned around uh, and, and started reducing the policy rate quite dramatically, eventually down to minus a half. And then, as you can see, inflation picked up. Uh, it's now back close to the target. The real interest rate came down. Policy became very e expansionary. The krona depreciated again. And unemployment, unemployment started coming down. 
Monetary policy seems to work like clockwork in Sweden. If you raise, inflation drops, unemployment uh, uh, goes up, and, and vice versa. So, so monetary policy really works in, the, in, in that country. So what about uh, leaning uh, against the wind? Well, there is widespread skepticism against leaning beyond the BIS, Norges Bank, and the RBA. Uh, it's easy to find uh, quotes and results. Uh, <laughs> nevertheless, the debate uh, uh, seems to continue. I might think that it should soon be over, but, but, uh, but that is not the case. Uh, I, uh, well, in the paper there are uh, quotations from Benanke, Evans, Williams, uh, IMF, a very thorough policy paper uh, in the fall of 2015. FOMC had a discussion with conclusions uh, in, in, in April 2016. Uh, very interestingly, uh, uh, Franklin Allen, Charlie Bean, and uh, José de Gregorio uh, wrote an independent review of BIS research and, and uh, with some, some uh, comments relative to this debate. Uh, uh, I, I, well, the research program somewhat one-eyed. Out of nine projects, the first and maybe the fifth seem motivated primarily by a desire, primarily by a desire to overturn my uh, conclusion on the inadvisability of law. My conclusion is actually that one should do a cost-benefit analysis, but anyhow. Uh, even the Riksbank now in its policy report uh, says things that indicate that it thinks the costs are higher uh, than the benefits. So anyhow, what are the costs of a higher policy rate? Well, a weaker economy, lower inflation and higher unemployment. Uh, if uh, no uh, crisis, uh, there is a cost because a non-crisis loss uh, will be larger. This is what I call the first cost. Because there is also a cost if a crisis occurs. The crisis loss will be larger if the economy is initially weaker because of leaning. That is a second cost of leaning, and that turns out to be more important, the main cost. The second cost has been disregarded in previous literature, including my own work. Okay, the possible benefits. Well, a lower probability uh, or a smaller magnitude uh, of a crisis. Those are the possible benefits. But empirically, when you look at it, the costs exceed the benefits by a substantial margin. And the reason is that the policy rate effects on the probability and magnitude are too small uh, to matter, matter much. I mean, monetary policy has too small an effect on financial stability. Somewhat surprisingly, I can show that if you have less effective macroprudential policy with a higher probability of a crisis or a larger magnitude or a longer duration, that tends to increase costs more than benefits. So actually the case against gets stronger, uh, co contrary to what you, what you first might think. Anyhow, the result of, of cost exceeding benefits is pretty robust. I mean, if you want to turn it around and get to break even when, when costs and benefits are equal, you need uh, between five and 40 standard errors larger estimates than the typical benchmark uh, uh, estimates. Okay, so here is what it, if you look at the expected loss in the future quarter T, uh, P is the probability of a crisis, so one minus P is the probability of no crisis, uh, P enters there. Uh, LN is a non-crisis loss, LC is a crisis loss, these are indirect loss functions. Behind, there is flexible inflation targeting, the Phillips curve. Uh, so, so these are functions of unemployment, but it's the, optimal, it's the unemployment that is optimal given the underlying uh, optimization with the Phillips curve and, and the quadratic loss function over unemployment and, and inflation. Uh, UN is a non-crisis uh, unemployment rate. UC is the crisis unemployment rate. U star 
is the optimal unemployment rate under flexible inflation targeting when you set the probability of a crisis equal to zero. So we're talking about deviations from optimal policy uh, when you set the probability equal to zero. And delta UT is a crisis unemployment increase, the magnitude of the crisis. Net of cleaning, I mean, cleaning might reduce the cost a bit, but delta is the unemployment equivalent increase uh, after any, 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 any cleaning. So the, the uh, crisis unemployment rate, UC, is the sum of the uh, non-crisis unemployment rate, UN, and this delta, uh, UT. Okay, leaning then is raising the policy rate. And let's start at the point where, where the non-crisis unemployment rate is equal to the optimal uh, uh, <coughs> flexible inflation targeting when the probability of a crisis is zero. Uh, so when we, in that situation, what happens if we conduct a bit tire, tighter policy and raise the, the uh, policy rate and unemployment goes up a bit. So when we just take the derivative of the expression above, uh, the derivative of the first uh, term here, that will be zero. This one is zero, and the derivative with respect to UN will also be zero. So uh, all the action is over there, the probability of a, cr a, a crisis plus the crisis loss. Uh, and. Uh, uh, we also get the effects, effects through the increase in, un in unemployment rate and also the effects through a reduction in the probability of a crisis and a possible reduction in the magnitude of a crisis. Uh, and it all, it, it's all because these, these terms um, enter there. That's, that's uh, uh, why we get these effects. And then I call them in red the marginal cost and then the two green terms, the marginal benefit of a lower probability and the marginal benefit of a lower uh, magnitude. Uh, so here, it was, here is what it looks in this benchmark case. It's actually a bit tilted in favor. Uh, I assume a permanent uh, effect of monetary policy on, on real debt, which I think is unrealistic. I also assume that the effect of policy on, on uh, uh, debt to income is unrealistically large. There are many studies that show that the effect of the policy rate on debt to income, if you raise the policy rate, debt to income goes down because you have a bigger impact on nominal GDP than on the stock of debt. It's very inertial. But anyhow, I, I actually uh, stack the cards in favor of, of leaning here. But still, uh, so here are the terms. You see that's a marginal cost, uh, the red curve. The solid green is a marginal benefit from lower uh, probability. The dashed is the marginal benefit from a lower uh, magnitude. And, and to the right, you see the cumulative marginal cost. I mean, the, the, the areas under the curves on the left, that's really what matters. And you see that the, the marginal cost is substantially higher than the marginal benefit. And there are, only, there are five inputs here, the probability of a crisis, the magnitude of a crisis, the policy rate effects on unemployment, the probability, and the magnitude of the crisis. It's only these five inputs that you need. Few assumptions, very simple, transparent, preferred to a complicated analysis, uh, I would say. I like uh, Occam's razor, the simpler, uh, the better. And it's easy to redo. Any of you here can redo this with your own estimates uh, and numbers and, and, and see what you get. And if you get something different from what I get, please, please let me know. And I think this is a possible framework for comparing new and old results. If you know uh, these derivatives from other papers, you can plug them in and see what, what they get. Uh, one can say a bit more about that, how, the, how you construct uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, different... Uh, this is the probability of a crisis which enters in several ways. This one could be upward sloping, uh, so one could actually have a, a build-up of, of, of risk over, 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 over time. Uh, okay, this, so this is what the benchmark unemployment response looks like. Uh, uh, 
the gray is the policy rate. Uh, Exper I mean, policy rate is increased by 100 basis points for four quarters and then goes back to, to benchmark. Uh, the delta U, uh, the, the crisis increase in the unemployment net of cleaning is assumed to be 5%. So then you get this marginal cost uh, curve uh, like that. That is what the uh, probability effect, uh, the effect of the pol policy rate on the probability looks like. And this is uh, effect on the magnitude. Uh, and I use the representative benchmark estimates uh, uh, from the IMF, from the Riksbank, Schulerich and Taylor, Flodén, Jorda, Schulerich and Taylor, and, and so on. Uh, actually, there is a summary of my paper in an appendix to, Blo uh, to Claudius' uh, paper. And if I interpret in a table, if I interpret it that right, he says that I assume cleaning there is no effect on the magnitude, there is no build-up of risks, and the deviation is from a Taylor rule. This is not exactly right, uh, as I just explained here. But anyhow, for financial stability, I think there is really no choice but to use financial stability policy. Monetary policy simply cannot do it. Uh, and we can see it here. If you look at the green solid curve on the right, that is uh, the probability of uh, uh, a crisis uh, that I'm, I'm using the benchmark pro pro probability of a crisis. And the, the dashed green shows the policy rate effect of raising the policy rate by 100 basis points for four quarters. And as you can see, there is, there is a little wiggle there. Uh, it's obvious that you, 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 this cannot have much benefits. But uh, then there is a paper by Giovanni and, uh, and uh, uh, four of his uh, uh, collaborators, Benefits and Cost of Capital, an IMF staff discussion paper. And it has the following results, that if you would have had 20% capital relative to risk-weighted assets uh, in the OECD countries since 1970, if you had had that capital, you would have had enough capital to cover the losses in 80% of the historical uh, banking crisis. So you would have, if you believe this result, you would have reduced, uh, 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 reduced uh, the probability to, to, to a fifth of what it is. And you see, you would, you would uh, shift this curve down, the green curve down to the thick dash curve at the bottom, a dramatic effect on the frequency. It's an order of magnitude more than, than you can do with monetary policy according to my numbers. So that, that is the way to, to go uh, capital and uh, enough capital reducing funding risks. That takes you a lot uh, in terms of financial stability. Uh, here is a result that not everybody may know about. Uh, uh, suppose we have some systematic low. Actually, that implies lower average inflation and interest rates, a larger risk for the effectively wrong. Let's take the simplest possible policy rule, this simplified Taylor rule here. R, I is the policy rate. R is the average real interest rate. Take the unconditional mean uh, and then assume the Fisher equation. Uh, and actually only an average Fisher equation. That means that this uh, uh, marked part will be zero. So the average inflation will be uh, pi star, the inflation target, and the average interest rates will be uh, the average real interest rate plus the inflation target. Well, well known, okay. Now assume that we modify this loss function, sorry, this reaction function a bit. We add the term alpha t which uh, is due to leaning against the wind, depends, is a response to some indicators, debt to GDP or real debt growth or, or something else. Uh, assume that the average uh, of this alpha t is alpha and is positive. Then take the unconditional mean uh, of this and then apply uh, the average Fisher equation, equation two, that means that this marked part will again be zero. And you can rewrite that so the average inflation is equal to pi double star, which is less than pi star. Average inflation lower, and the average 
interest rate will be R plus pi double star uh, lower than R plus the inflation target. So we get lower average inflation, a lower policy rate, a larger risk for hitting the effective lower bound. Can this really be good? I, I, I doubt it. Anyhow, let me sum up here. Uh, I think it's important to remember that economic policies should only have goals that they can achieve. And monetary policy would not have financial stability as a goal. Uh, well, these are things that I have already said. And regarding leaning against the wind, only if supported by a convincing cost-benefit analysis. And I look forward to seeing an example uh, yeah, of, of such an analysis that has different results than what I found. And uh, you, you probably should be happy that the Swedish experiment was, thus in, was done in a small country and not, not uh, in a large uh, country. And I think uh, the cost-benefit framework presented, it's so simple, transparent, easily applied. Uh, anyone could do it, use it, and also uh, possibly show that I'm wrong. Uh, and systematic leaning may, if it's represented as I did, actually lower the average inflation and the interest rate. Uh, and I don't see how that would improve uh, financial stability. Let me end. Thanks. Thank you, Lars.